If it shot out like if it went out today, four years later we would realize that it went out, but it would have been four years ago. That's 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 the closest outside of the sun to us. So light from the sun uh, can reach the earth from our sun reaches the earth from our light source reaches the earth in eight minutes. If the sun went out right now, if it just went black right now, we would still be getting sunlight for eight minutes before it actually went dark. Mm. That, that, that shows you there's distance. There, that's a lot of distance. Um, if I turn the light off at my house, you would see instantly that my light went out. But if the sun's light goes out, you wouldn't know that it went out for eight years. That means there's a lot of space in between you and the sun. Now let's take that furthest star, eight, bill, 10 billion light years away. You wouldn't even know it went out. There's light probably you're still getting right now that went out a long time ago. So I'm saying all that to say this. Even the nearest star shows a vast distance between um, us and that star. It was a modern Earth a spaceship or the modern ship or any kind of ship with any kind of propulsion, it would take to get to that nearest star 81,000 years. The one that has its 40 light years away. 81,000 uh, years to get there. That's, that's, there's two realities that exist. We live in a very tiny corner of the universe, is one reality. The second reality is the universe is vast in our, in our um, and it, it outdoes that word. It's, it's too vast for us to comprehend it. We live in a very small corner of the universe, and on top of that, we can't even comprehend the vastness of the universe. How do you comprehend something that's 10 billion light years away? The fact that you know that it's 10 years like uh, 10,000 billion light years away doesn't tell you much about it, the star itself. You don't know what it, what it looks like, the core, you don't know what it's made of, you don't know what surrounds it, what kind of solar system it is. There's so many unanswered questions. The fact that you even know that it's 10 billion years away is, is hardly comprehensible. So we're falling really short when it comes to our understanding of what we're comprehending. But that's what God's love is. It's greater, it's vaster, it's larger, it's bigger and broader in all dimensions than anything we've known. It's, it's, it's the universe itself is huge. And his love is simply, the universe is in the pocket, in his pocket. And that might be more space than it needs. And, it, and yet we try to understand how much he loves me. What have you done for me lately, Lord? Do you love me? I've been sick a long time. I lost my house. I lost my car. I lost my loved one. Do you really love me? You need to prove. Say, you're talking foolishness mm -hmm. to a God who, who his love, <laughs> he holds the universe in a pocket of his love. And he's so much bigger than that. So when, we're, when we talk about it, we have to be very careful. Um, but you'll never reach it, no matter how far, no matter how fast, no matter what kind of a, a spaceship you're flying. I love Star Trek. I know warp speed. Those of you that are Star or Trekkies, y'all understand on warp speed. Um, knowing and looking at warp speed or whatever spacecraft, you might be Star Wars. I don't know, jet propulsion. I don't know what kind of speed your spacecraft flies at. But you take the fastest the thing that you can imagine that you can fly in, and, and you go as far as you can, as fast as you can, until there's nothing else out there, guess what? Right there with you. Yep. You cannot outrun, outfly, outmaneuver, outdo his love. He's always going to be there. No matter how far and how fast your sin mobile takes you, mm -hmm. his love is still right there. The depths of the darkest places you could go in the universe, as far as sin goes, his love is still right there. That's how broad our God is. So, you're never going to get to the end of it. God's love is still there, and, and you're never going to reach the end of it. So consider the magnitude of his love. And let's suppose this, because we talked about the east and the west. Take this journey with me really quick. Suppose that you want to go east until you finally reach the west. Okay, so we're going to head that way. We're going to head to New York, and we're going to go that way until we finally get to uh, back to the west. Ultimately, what you're going to understand is it's not possible. But let's try it. Okay, let's suppose that we want that we take up, we take off from Baltimore in a hot air balloon. Okay, we go over the Atlantic Ocean, got a lot of food. We go over the Atlantic Ocean until we land in Lisbon. Then we get to Lisbon, we jump into a Honda Civic, and we drive all the way across Europe. Don't worry about gas, don't worry about food, just pretend with me. We got hotels, we're okay, but we're just traveling. 
we'll go all the way through Europe until we get to Bulgaria. Okay? Then we then we hop on a freighter, and this freighter takes us through the Black Sea, it takes us through the Aegean Sea, it takes us through the Mediterranean Sea, we even go on through the Suez Canal, we go on past the Red Sea to the Gulf of Aden, and we narrowly escape getting caught by pirates, but we keep going on <laughs> to the Indian Ocean, where we finally set ashore in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Okay, y'all still with me? Somebody wanna go home yet? Not yet, okay. So we're still going east. And we're, we're moving and we're, we catch a flight to Singapore. And then we go down south to Perth, Australia. Okay, so we're dropping a little bit. We're not going straight east. We're going to drop a little bit because it, we're just going to go ahead and hit Australia. Then we come back up and we hitchhike across the outback. And that's a journey in itself until we arrive in Sydney. We get to Sydney where we join a passenger ship and that ship takes us to Easter Island. Then we go and we fly to Santiago, Chile where we were in a beat up Jeep and we start driving north. Okay, from Chile, Chile, South America, way down there, and we start coming on up. Of course, you know, we come on up north, um, past Mexico, past Arizona, past uh, San Diego, San Francisco. We get all the way up here and we get back up to Nome, Alaska. All right, we're back on track. Where we get on a dog sled team uh, and we start traveling, ending, ending up in Anchorage, Alaska, and then where we hop on a cruise ship. Now, that sounds a little, we're getting there, a cruise ship makes up for the dog, uh, <laughs> the dog trip journey, but we're still moving. Vancouver, and then we jump on Trans-Canadian Railroad, and it takes all the way across Canada, where we end up in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and there we hit a, uh, we buy a high-end ro road bike, and we start pedaling, and we go through New Brunswick, we hit Maine, go down to Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, New Jersey, till we end up right back in Delaware. Finally, we make it back to Baltimore, where we took off in the first place. Now, besides having circumvented the entire globe, what have we actually accomplished? Along with a lot of things, I'm sure we have accomplished a lot of things, what we have accomplished is understanding that no matter how far we go east looking for west, you're never going to find the west. West is always going to be out there. It's going to be a direction that's opposite of the east. So when God says he takes your sins and he casts them as far as the east is from the west, what he says is they're lost. They're lost, they're lost in a concept. They're, I mean, I, I don't even say a concept. They're lost. You're never going to be able to find them because you're always going to be headed toward the direction and never knowing they're, they're, they're totally the opposite direction. So I love, I love that, that, um, that poem because it gives us some idea that if I keep going, if I do keep going far, 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 far east, I'm still never going to end up in the west. Okay, so you're never going to have to worry about your sins again. They're not going to meet again. Amen. So that's the magnitude of God's love. And here's good news for all the sinners of the world. When God forgives, he removes your sins. He takes them from you. He lifts them up and then he takes them away. You don't have to look at them unless you call for them again, or unless you repeat them again. Once he brings you out of sin, you are out of sin indefinitely until you invite sin back into your life. And I love, I love that idea. Even if you're if somebody that you, and then some of people we know oftentimes go and they end up finding our sins in the West. Even when they find them, it doesn't matter in God's eyes. God has removed them from you. Others may still remember them, talk about them, but God has removed them from being accredited or counted unto you as unrighteousness. God has given you righteousness, and there's no way that your unrighteousness should meet it again unless you allow it to. So, when God forgives, he removes those sins and he takes them from us. He puts them very far from us. And if you search a thousand years, you would never be able to find them. So men's sins can never come back and haunt them again. Even Satan himself can't bring them back. So verse 8, we talked about slow to anger. God has a long fuse. Verse 9, he doesn't harbor his anger forever. Amen. He has a very short memory. Um, verse 10, he doesn't treat us the way our sins deserve. He has a thick skin. And number 11 and 12, he has a great heart. Amen. So that is so great that is so his love is so great that he's removed our sins that far from us. I thank God for that. And it sounds funny today, and it sounds like it doesn't mean anything. 
It will mean something. When you step into eternity and realize that there really is no east and west in eternity, to the minute you leave this temple place down here, the poles disappear. North, south, east, west, time, class, race, status, all these things disappear. And when you step into eternity, everything is right there present. So, understanding that, he, your sins have been left beneath him, outside of eternity. What a blessing. Amen. Because if you enter into eternity with your sins still on you, God cannot allow you into eternal rest. They've got to be removed. So this is very important. Uh, if you could shout today, you can thank him today, amen, good for you. I can. These are the things I think about. I know the detriment my sins are bringing to me. I know what my sins are, called, are, are holding me into. And I thank God that he's given me a way out of it. Amen. So, Amen. we're glad um, for that. I'm very excited for that. Number five, and this is the last point we'll talk about today, is that he understands our weaknesses. This is also important. All of these are important, but they're not things that everyone thinks about. But I thank God that he understands my weakness. Listen to this, verse 13. As far as compassion, as, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those that fear him. As the Lord, as the Father has compassion upon his children, so does the Lord have compassion upon those that fear him and love him. And I can remember, I, I never understood that verse until I had children for myself. And I, I'll never forget the minute. Even the whole time my wife was pregnant, it was real to her. She had tears, she was happy, she was nesting. Get the kids' rooms ready. She talked about them as if they were here now. Fathers, especially a first-time father, um, I really could bond with her in that way. <laughs> it was it was still not a reality. It all was in her belly. She ate, she slept. It was, you know, I saw her, and I didn't get it. She got it. She was she knew there was something inside of her alive. She nurtured and she cared and loved what was in what was inside of her. But I was still detached. Maybe that was because we failed to communicate properly, or I didn't read the right book. But I just couldn't get it. I didn't get it until that baby's head started counting. And the doctors were pulling that baby out of my wife and asked me to cut that umbilical cord. And I watched the baby cry for the first time. And I, I saw them take the baby away and I rushed, forget Sandy, I'm looking at this baby and I'm just amazed. It was the first time it really it hit me like a ton of bricks. The reality hit me, and I saw my child, and I'm thinking, okay, the baby's in their hands now, but in a minute, that's going to be my responsibility. <laughs> everything, everything slowed down, and I just begin to, I really begin to understand that I am needed in this baby's life. I am instrumental, more than that, in this child's life. If, it, if, it's not, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I'm going to let this child down. This child needs me, and as I begin to watch, over the weeks and the, and, the, and the months on how dependent this baby really was. Couldn't even hold its own head up. Couldn't even, couldn't hardly burp on it. Burp on its own? No, I could burp three times in four seconds. Wow. This child, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> this baby couldn't even burp on its own. Can't eat, can't clean itself, couldn't, couldn't provide shelter. None of these things would be taken for granted. Couldn't hardly scratch itself where it wanted to scratch. It might have an itch, but it ain't gonna scratch where it needs to scratch. This child needed me. And for the first time in my life, I began to realize what this scripture talks about. A father has compassion on his children. You know there's some fathers that don't. Amen. And I think when this was written, the laws of nature still apply to some degree where parents naturally care for their children. Nowadays you have mothers that Throw the children in trash cans at birth. Don't care, don't nurture the child in the womb or outside of the womb. You've got some really bad parents out there. But when this is written, common sense, natural law, fathers have compassion on their children. They care about them. Mothers do too, did too. So the Lord has compassion on us. So I never really understood until I did. And it's like singing a song to your child to, to, to calm them down and to... to to make them feel comfortable. You just start making songs up. And then and I would do that a lot. I just make a tune up and sing to the baby while the baby sat there. And I didn't know if they enjoyed it, but in my mind, they were really enjoying it. And I'm just singing the song to them. I'll make another one up tomorrow. 
And, and the songs are so real in my head today that I can hear just one part of it. I could probably start singing the song all over again today. And I often do when they come to my mind. But you become so uh, needed as a provider to your children. I think I'm not saying it's easy to forget it, but our children need us. And if we're not there to provide for them, um, who would be? Now, I said all that to say this. Heavenly fathers, earthly, I'm sorry, earthly fathers, however imperfect they are, point us upward to our heavenly fathers. Now, at least that's what the concept is. We're supposed to be so um, walking with God, so close that our descendants, our legacy, our posterity beneath us to be able to look back to us and recognize the relationship of us and our Heavenly Father. In everything I do, our children should be able to see that I'm emulating my Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells me not to provoke my children to wrath. Why? Because God doesn't provoke us to wrath spiritually. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells me to provide for my family and my children. Why? Because God provides for His children. The Bible tells us how, tells us how a father should act. Why? Because God has given the father and the earthly father the role to teach the concept of fatherhood. Unfortunately, we've come way short of what we should do. We don't. We don't emulate God the way we should. And the Old Testament, I love it because they were taught to buy the word of God on their forehead, on their doorpost, teach it to the kids coming, teach it to the kids as they go, put the word of God in them. They really set up their children to know and walk in relationships. But today, things are turned around. Things are different. So our earthly fathers are imperfect. They point us towards our heavenly father. So when an earthly father has done his job well, he makes it very easy for his children to believe that there is a heavenly father that he loves. An earthly father that has not done his job well, or an earthly father that has been absent, or an earthly father that has been abusive, it's very difficult to preach that there's a loving Father in heaven. God has to teach himself to you all over again. He has to reestablish some truths about true, true and good fatherhood. And if he does, if he loves you enough and you listen enough, you can meet him, whether you had a father or not. You can meet God in a, in a perfect way. But God has sent men down here to be a father to those that don't, don't understand the concept. And we're just as needy to our Heavenly Father as our, we, are, our, our, we are our children are needy to the earthly father. We need him to provide for us. We need him to scratch for our itches. We need him to provide shelter spiritually and physically. We need him to do all the things we just described. Help us burp some of this mess that we digest down here. Help us clear ourselves up. We need him to do it. So we look to him and our children learn this and they learn to do uh, they learn to do and honor and please and walk with God the way we show them to do how the way we show them to do it. Amen. So if we if our children learn that we don't worship a God of stone or we don't worship empty idols or we don't worship gold or silver, guess what? They'll grow up with the right concept there. We don't worship. We honor God not in the worship of what He's created, but we honor Him in His vast, infinite, infinite love and grace. And we teach our children that. Amen. Not, and not some remote deity um, or impersonal machine in the sky, but we worship him in a loving way, in true relationship. I talk about relationship a lot. I don't know if y'all really hear me. As close as I was to my dad, as dependent as I was to my natural dad, as lovely, as much love as I had for my natural dad, and as much loyalty that I had for my natural dad, I would defend my dad against anybody. That's just as my dad. He goes down, I gotta go down with him. With, with, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's how I was raised. But that same love I have for him, I have it more for God. Because I, I've been taught loyalty, I've been taught love, I've been provided for, I've been cared for, I've been nurtured to the point now to where I understand what's expected of me when it comes to my father. And I honor him and I bless him. So we deserve a God I'm sorry, we don't deserve wrong word. We serve a God, rather, that knows our weaknesses, yet loves us anyway. He knows that we can't wipe our own nose. He knows we can't change our own diaper. He knows we can't hold our own bottle. Yet, he takes the time to develop us, to nurture us, to prepare us, 
to raise us up into being great men and great women. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that's it. We're going to stop on point five today. He understands our weaknesses. So all we think about, think about these two things. First, he forgives all of our sins. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And second, he understands all of our weaknesses. Nothing goes beyond him. He knows what you're in need of, and he loves you. Give the Lord a hand and praise this morning.